think of what you're doing, especially at the graduate level, as being actually at the cutting edge of those fields. With regard to cutting edge, then, we have with us tonight, then, the, one of the handful of people who have been reshaping the future of landscape architecture practice, but not as a landscape architect, but as a, as a designer, as a person who cares about environments and about places for <coughs> human habitation in a, in a really uh, uh, significant and powerful way. So it really is the case, I think, that in the last 10, 15, 20 years, the field of landscape architecture has been transformed. And with it, how landscape architects and architects and planners and a thousand other people who come together on teams see what we're doing as part of a larger whole and as something significant itself. So, Waldheim is, uh, is, is known to, to many of you because you've had to read from the landscape urbanism reader uh, chapters, one after another, in one seminar or another, or one course or another course. And, and uh, his putting that together here, of bringing all sorts of people together, is essentially what he does, and brings them together about very important subjects with many points of view, with just the reality and complexity of, uh, of the world. He is the director of landscape studies at the <coughs> University of Toronto. He's uh, taught at many other places. That I may I underline this in myself today, because that's one of the more important ones. But there's some place called Harvard. University of Pennsylvania, University of Michigan, but up to Aaron Zurich, <coughs> and the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and the Technical University of Vienna, and he's the recipient of the Rome Prize. And, and, and I'd like to hear from him, so I, I'm not going to go on and on and on, but, but the landscape urbanism reader is in a way like the, the slide book slides, but there are lots of other publications. The, uh, uh, about Chicago, about uh, Detroit, the Millennium Garden, Stalking Detroit is a pretty extraordinary one. There's a new one um, on the way. Uh, we were told that uh, the way what to Chicago, uh, or to O'Hare Airport. So, so that's an interesting thing. So, well, it is. So I'm sure it is. But, but uh, these things don't come by themselves, and so it's part of the the perspective of our school that our study cut across all of the disciplines and fields that have to do with building really humane and ecologically sensible and really beautiful places. So let's have Charles Waldheim tell us a little something. circles that I travel in, 
So the, the talk that I've organized this evening is um, a bit of a departure um, in some respects. Uh, over the course of the last couple of years, I've been invited on a number of occasions to address a section of the urban design in town. And for the first several years after the publication of uh, the Lancet Urban Demeanor, uh, I turned down requests to address audience of some length, uh, primarily because I'm not trained as a planner, and those are a little bit of a planning of but over the course of the last year, I've got two invitations to talk to an audience of planners that I simply couldn't turn down. One was the American Planning Association's conference in October, and the other was the Department of Urban Planning in Harvard, both asking me to sort of explain what this development of Lancet Urban Urban meant to their work. So that's the talk for this evening, is to talk about the emergence of landscape and perception topology and their relevance for urban planners and urban planning. And I don't know to what extent that doing the research that keeps you in the practice here. Um, but one of my other roles is to, um, unlike last time when I focused you know, mostly on my own research, to try to pull together a range of examples to explain the urban process that actually happens in, in, in the particular site of the landscape, to try to explain a little bit of the hindrances that are available uh, with respect to this work. Um, about 12 years ago, I coined the term landscape urbanism to describe tendency that I saw emerging in which landscape architects were eclipsing the work of urban designers and urban planners and were poised to become the profession but also the disciplinary framework in which the contemporary city was understood. Um, this is now, I think it's fair to say, an historical fact. Um, my purposes this evening are really to ask a more basic question. Um, a whole generation of urban designers and planners um, imagined their work to be the organization of the city around environmental issues. And I'll refer to this as a kind of shorthand, as a, a, um, a regionally informed ecological planning practice. And the question for us this evening is essentially, how is it that we've gone from that aspiration, an aspiration, let's say, post-1968, that the city could be organized around uh, ecological concerns to today's concern for, let's call it, designer ecology. So how, how have we gone over the course of 25 years from ecological design to designer ecology? And I apologize about the circle, it's a, it's a cheap shot, but um, it was the easiest way that I had to telegraph this transition. Now the most common formulation of the questions that I've gotten from urban planners and urban designers um, have tended to be questions along the lines of, haven't we been trying since 1968 to organize the contemporary city around, around ecological knowledge? Wasn't this, in fact, the project of Ian McCarg, his 1969 um, design with nature, uh, essentially redefining the terms of debate around urban planning? And in fact, my answer has been, well, yes, in fact, this has been the goal for an entire generation of urban planners and designers. Um, the difficulty or the present condition that we find ourselves in, I think, is that the McCargian project, for lack of a better term, has been perceived by many to be a dead end, not for its failure. In fact, it was an enormous success internationally changing the terms of the question of the contemporary city. It's been perceived as a dead end, not because of a lack of environmental literacy or broader environmental awareness. It's been perceived as a dead end because we've decided not to plan. That is, in the West, and particularly in North America, we've decided to organize our cities around economic processes as opposed to organizing them around environmental pro processes. And to the extent a generation of landscape architects that trained with McCarg had an agenda to organize a city around environmental literacy with welfare state planning apparatus, the transition is not that we're no longer literate about environmental issues, it's not that we don't have the same environmental awareness or concern, it's that we now occupy a condition in most urban situations where um, the economic realities of a kind of new neoliberal economic agenda uh, determine urban form. So what, what does this mean for our work? Landscape urbanism has emerged to try to describe this new condition, a new condition in which the aspiration to organize the city rationally, empirically, around scientific terms has largely been abandoned. In its place, and maybe for some ironically, landscape architects have now re-emerged, not as the empirical planner, but rather as those designers most capable of intervening in the, in the contemporary city. 
What does this mean for urban planning? If you've been following the literature around urban planning in, in the last year, I've been doing a little bit of reading into the subject um, with respect to these two talks that I've agreed to do. Um, it's clear that urban planning is looking increasingly at landscape and this development of landscape urbanism and is looking for some kind of leadership. In most contexts, urban planning has become the impediment to change. Certainly in most North American contexts, and many of my examples will, will refer to Toronto, my, my, my adopted hometown. In many contexts, planning has become the mechanism to prevent change. It's become the mechanism to essentially insulate communities from the ravages of economic order, but also to resist the new kinds of environmental conditions that are perceived to be detrimental to urban life. Um, equally, planning has increasingly been concerned with questions of social policy and, and social ju justice to the expense of questions of, of urban form or spatial form. Now, this is nothing new. This, these are things that are quite well known with it, with, within the field. And in fact, urban planning left schools of architecture even before 1968, already in the 1950s, being radicalized around social and environmental issues. Um, with respect to the question of urban design, uh, urban design as a discipline was invented about 50 years ago in a couple of universities in the English language as a disciplinary home in which the spatial concerns, the formal concerns that, that urban planning was leaving could be addressed uh, primarily through the architectural lens there was a moment at Harvard in 1956 when urban design could have been housed within landscape architecture as a disciplinary framework, but that was not to be. And for Sert, his idea of the urban-minded architect was one who was both culturally literate but equally one who was able to arrange a spatial organization at the scale that the contemporary metropolis demanded. Somehow neither of those formulations, urban planning nor urban design, are able to adequately sum up what I think many perceive as the increasing relevance of landscape architects in ar ar arriving at urban form. And for our purposes this evening, what, what I want to suggest is that we've reached a kind of tipping point where the modernist critiques, the critiques of the last 30 years or so, the failures of modernism, have been overstated. Uh, my own work with respect to Lafayette Park, I'll say a bit about, but what I want to suggest is I'm just one of a whole range of historians and theorists and critics who are arguing that planning and its resistance to modernism at, at the larger scale has been overstated. So what does this mean? A part of it means the recuperation of figures like Ludwig Hilbersheimer. And when I was here last time, I, I spoke at length about Detroit and the impact of Hilbersheimer's planning theories for this community of Lafayette Park. Hilbersheimer was this German city planner, you'll recall, who had this idea of organizing the city around the organic order of the American economic conditions, and one in which ecology became a very important medium. He produced over the course of his career exactly one built project, this Lafayette Park Urban Renewal Project in Detroit, housing about 3,000 in a classic German Siedlung. Now, of course, Hilbersheimer uh, I'm recuperating primarily because He's not very well known for Lafayette Park. He's primarily known for images like this from the 1920s, the so-called Grosstadt architecture, the big city architecture, high-rise architecture, work which w became the, the very image of the failure of modernism. In graduate school, these were the projects that we were given as the image of the failure of the modern architect to deal with the contemporary city. Um, what's less well reported, of course, is that Hilbersheimer abandoned that work as early as the 1920s in favor of this kind of work in Germany a uh, mixed height housing across a verdant field of landscape. He takes those interests with him as he immigrates in 1933 to Chicago to what becomes the Illinois Institute of Technology and produces projects like this called the New Regional Pattern. Hilbersheimer is a quintessential modernist. He thinks that the erasure of the existing historic si city fabric is the first necessary precondition for the construction of a new urban order. He's interested in order in that Aristotelian sense of order, the relationship of each part to the whole in a commensurate uh, proportion. Uh, he shares this interest with his uh, longtime collaborator, Mies van der Rohe, and Mies and Hilbs co conspire to produce a community in the context of Detroit's ongoing abandonment and decay. They produced a community in which uh, the modern architecture is of high quality, but the spatial construction, the spatial medium, the, the medium of community is essentially, I, I don't know what else to call it, but landscape. Uh, in these photographs, this is Hedrick Blessing, 1957, and Jordi Bernadeau, 2002, you see this quality of space in which it's really landscape which affords the medium of, of urban order. 
Now, of course, in recuperating Hilbersheimer, I'm trying to be polemic. I'm trying to overstate this slightly to both uh, gain your attention, but equally to suggest that the economic and the ecological conditions of the contemporary North American city, uh, these are challenges which we addressed earlier in the 20th century. What I like about Lafayette Park is that it does exactly everything that we've been trained not to do. It removes the historic street fabric. It produces a, a figure of towers in the park. It introduces landscape as a medium, both of economic and ecological order. In so doing, it produced the most racially integrated community in the context of Detroit, the most socially progressive, but equally the most environmentally sustainable community. And what I like about Lafayette Park is that its success fell completely out of history. I'm interested in the reception of Lafayette Park and these uh, critiques of the failure of modernism, because I find the narrative around city building, the discourse that we have within the design disciplines about the form that the city should take, has necessarily constrained our options and in a way that doesn't really help us understand where we are today. Now, Lafayette Park was quite well publicized. It was received in the professional press, but its cri cri criticism uh, was uh, quite, um, quite evident in the work of somebody like Charles Jenks. You, you'll recall Charles Jenks was the architectural critic who, uh, with others, launched uh, the postmodern critiques against modernism. And Jenks, in 1966, then a graduate student in London, begins the work that would culminate um, a decade later with the so-called uh, postmodern movement. Uh, in 1966, Jenks argued in this essay called The Problem of Mies, that Mises' architecture could only be second rate, ultimately, because he doesn't understand the history of the city, among other things. Uh, ultimately, in 77, with the demolition of the prude Igo uh, housing tract in St. Louis, Charles Jan Jenks would famously declare the, the so-called death of modern architecture. That's well-established history, and I'm not um, really contributing to it in any substantive way, but what I do want to suggest here is that there's a generational cohort, not only my own work, but the work of Hilary Ballin at Columbia, uh, Keller Easterling at Yale, uh, the work of somebody like Sarah Whiting at Princeton. There are a group of historians and theorists and critics who are looking back at the history of modernist planning and asking, well, haven't we thrown the baby out with the bathwater? In this critique, this postmodern critique of the failure of modernist urbanism, haven't we lost the only viable green threads that we had? And in fact, many of those authors are working on projects to recuperate architects and urban planners of the 20th century for their green credentials. On that score, I would posit Hilbersheimer we could understand as a kind of proto-landscape urbanist, somebody who uses ecological knowledge around which to organize the city. And this is, of course, a very, very different understanding than the understanding that uh, came to be the McCargian agenda in 1968. Now, w without dwelling much further on this uh, critique of the failure of the McCargian era, uh, which I've described as largely a failure of the welfare state. That is, we've decided not to plan. We've decided not to collectively tax ourselves to build or organize a robust uh, public realm. Um, what, what are we to make of these projects of landscape urbanism that have emerged over the last 15 years? Um, so what I've organized uh, for the talk is a, a couple of greatest hits from the last 20 years. These are projects that you know quite well. They've been quite well examined. My purpose is not to rehearse them again, but rather to ask a simple question. What's the status of planning in these projects? Because increasingly what I'm trying to build to is a thesis this evening that suggests that in many contexts, the reason that landscape has emerged is that it's found as a medium that can actually circumvent planning practice. And often landscape design is being called upon these days to go around a planning bureaucracy, which is perceived to be in various contexts either uh, inept, ineffectual, uh, somehow even potentially uh, corrupt in certain contexts. So let's begin with some of the European projects. I'll show you two very, very briefly to rehearse some of the basic claims. Among the basic claims of the Landscape Urbanist Project are that ecological performance is being asserted as a medium of city making. And in this context, one would think of Adrian Hoos and West Eight's Shell Project from the Eastern Storm Barrier along the Dutch coast on the North Sea a piece of highway infrastructure, certainly a piece of the welfare state in the Dutch context, in which Hus, the young landscape architect, pr proposes mussel shells, uh, again, a reused or recyclable material found in this ecosystem, and he organizes them in a series of parallel stripes. Those of you that follow the work of Dutch uh, architect Rem Koolhaas and OMA know that the stripes are a kind of wink at the OMA La Villette competition entry of 1982, a kind of inside reference. But also you know that this is a, a way to organize birds and uh, invite the birds to alight based on the color of their feathers uh, through predation and natural selection, 
those birds have learned essentially as a species to land on stripes of shells that happen to coincide with the color of their feathers, uh, so as essentially camouflaging them. Now this is a kind of ironic use of ecology, and it's one of the fundamental tenets of landscape urbanism, that ecology is being deployed as a kind of public spectacle. On the one hand, it is cleaning the air and the ground and the water. It is using recyclable materials and reducing carbon footprint and all those other things to save the planet. Having said that, it uses them as a foundation or a platform for design culture. Uh, equally, we could see in, in Hus's entry for um, the Schiphol Airport landscape in which uh, a landscape regime of clover and honey and bees uh, are organized to prevent or control bird strikes, uh, birds being really quite problematic with respect to operating airfields. Um, it produces a landscape that has some visual effect. There's a kind of cultural quality to it. But having said that, it's really the ecological performance of the land side and the air side landscapes, which is quite remarkable at Skip Hole. Now, in each of these examples, and we could look at an hour's long lecture of the French uh, projects, which are quite commensurate with this from the last 20 years, we would say that these are the products of welfare state planning. Of course, in the Dutch context, these are projects which have been planned exhaustively and in fact planned at every level of their existence from public funding through public participation and planning practice in the Dutch context. And at this point, we can argue that there's quite a difference between this experience of planning in the European context and the projects of landscape urbanism associated with the North American context. So, by way of two equal examples from the North American context, um, I'll start with Downsview Airport, the competition in 2000 in Toronto. Of course, by now canonical projects of landscape urbanism, these five entries. I'll show you one example. This is the James Corner, Stan Allen entry of the prize losing finalist scheme, which uh, in my estimation summed up about a decade's worth of research into what we now understand as landscape urbanism. But as I told uh, Jim and Stan, there's no possibility that a jury could vote for it, given its complexity over time, the range of regimes, the ecological knowledge. It presented both too much information, and of course it was the, the soothing Teletubby images, the, the circular images I showed earlier from the winning Mao and Coolhouse scheme, which won the day. Of course, here in Downsview, what we see are among the central tenets of landscape urbanist practice, beginning uh, not with desirable human outcomes, but designing around certain species, identifying certain celebrity megafauna, working from those species up into engineering habitat, right? Remembering that ecology is the relationship between species and their environment, identifying these species and then organizing uh, regimes which could be constructed so as to produce their environments. <coughs> Equally central to landscape urbanist practice, we see diagrams such as this at the bottom here. This is the work of the Corner Allen team with a planner called Nina Marie Lister, who's based in Toronto, an ecological planner. Uh, the basic premise or the basic claim being now quite common in landscape urbanist arguments that if you begin in early phases with very modest investments of public funds, you can in fact grow a more complex environmental regime or public space than you can afford to construct. So what, what's going on here is an argument about the indeterminacy or the open-endedness of ecological process, allowing succession, for example, to occur but essentially using that to grow a more complex regime or a more complex cultural construct than our modest public funds would allow. And this is a crucial difference in the North American context from the European practices. This is a site on which um, no planning had been done. And in fact, the design competition was invited precisely to replace what would be planning practice. This was a site owned by the military, the Canadian military, and in fact existed as a kind of loophole in the planning regimes that, that, that operated in, in the province of Ontario, the, the country of Canada, or the city of Toronto. Uh, and this becomes a remarkably durable reading. In fact, many of the classic North American examples of landscape urbanist work actually fall between the cracks of planning bureaucracies, or they're engineered precisely to respond where those planning bureaucracies are perceived to be ineffectual somehow. Another example, again, corner and field operations a couple of years later, this is the competition entry that they won for Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island. Through an historical political fluke, it happened to be at a moment in time, both the mayor of the city of New York and the governor of the state of New York happened to be Republicans. It's an odd once in a century historical alignment in regularly you know, reliable democratic seats. As soon as this happened, patronage money flowed toward the only reliably Republican voting borough around New York, Staten Island. 
Staten Island had suffered as a kind of refuse dump for over a century, having uh, come to be the home of the largest uh, landfill on, on, on the planet. And it was only when the mayor and the governor aligned politically that in fact funding flowed directly, not through the city planning bureaucracy, but rather, and not through the other agencies of the city or the state, but rather into design culture. So one of the things we could say very clearly is that in this neoliberal economic condition, landscape design is emerging as a medium which is both ecologically literate, but also of uh, cultural significance. And if you look at the Giuliani administration or the Bloomberg administration in New York, you could say that New York uh, with Toronto has become one of the most important venues for landscape urbanist practice uh, in North America. Equally, one could say that when we look at the competition entry and the work being constructed at Fresh Kills just now, similar claims are being made. That very, very modest investments using private philanthropy, private donations, which demand cultural leavening, they demand high, high status or uh, high visibility cultural producers, are then being used to introduce open-ended or indeterminate ecological processes. And the goal here is to try to steer modest investments of funds toward more complex ecological outcomes. In these diagrams, these are the kind of design development diagrams from the field operations office. They're using a kind of actuarial science, a kind of accounting to understand what kinds of installations, what kinds of planting should happen, and what degrees of predictability might we have for the physical or spatial outcomes, both in plan and in section. How can we use ecological knowledge to both produce culture but maybe more importantly, to produce a more complex uh, and more healthy uh, public environment than we can afford or maybe more than we have decided we can afford to pay for uh, collectively. I'm realizing I don't have any uh, California or West Coast examples um, in my talk tonight, but what I am going to try to do is sketch um, without being um, in any way uh, trying to cover all, all of the work that, that, that's available to try to touch on a couple of trends that I see in work that's maybe less well known than some of the, some of the canonical pieces. Um, so I'll be trying to cover off a range of different uh, geographic and cultural conditions, but also point to a couple of uh, trend lines that are, that are evident, continuing to come back to this basic question about, well, what does this mean for planning practice? The first theme of work that one could see uh, evident these days is um, landscape installations as a kind of cultural practice. These are basically art projects. They typically come from a combination of funding. Arts funding, either privately or publicly donated, um, combined with some infrastructure or some, some uh, public space improvement money. Um, I'll show you two examples of this tendency. One of them is from North America. This is Toledo, Ohio. It's the product of a series of design competitions that I um, put together with a guy called Mark Robbins, who's the, the dean at Syracuse. Mark and I consulted with the Arts Commission in Toledo and produced a series of design competitions over the course of the last couple of years. Um, the first of those design competitions in the context of this shrinking industrial city was for this site at the end of the Erie uh, Canal and also a place where the highway enters into Toledo. Um, this is an entry, a finalist entry for the first design competition by the office of Ken Smith, the uh, until recently New York-based uh, landscape architect. I guess he's got a foothold out here in Southern California these days. Um, he, he produced a project which, while it didn't win the competition, I quite like because it's like Ken, kind of pithy and funny. It's called Drapescape, and he says just hang a curtain and allow these invasive vines from the south to kind of be planted and kind of grow and screen all the middle ground stuff. Because he said the horizon is perfectly fine and the, the, the foreground is perfectly reasonable as well, but it's that middle ground of stuff that we really want to hide. Um, I'm not sure that the mayor of Toledo was thrilled with that idea. I think he was happier with the winning scheme. This is called Glass City by Julia Zerniak and Linda Pollock out of New York. Um, they proposed a scheme which traded in this history of Toledo as the c center of the glass industry, um, a place which was clearly a kind of rust belt classic shrinking city in which a series of environmental and cultural installations would signal one's arrival to the city from the point of view of the driver in the automobile. Um, I, I was particularly interested to see their approach to the environmental conditions. And this is again a kind of classic uh, using uh, e ecological literacy as a kind of irony or a kind of uh, cultural, uh, cultural joke. Um, they were working with a woman called Jackie Bruckner who does these amazing installations. Uh, she has a practice, Jackie does, which 
induces moss to grow in the most improbable of places. And it's a, on the one hand, it's kind of landscape. I don't know what else to call it, but it's primarily installed in, in curated environments. She does this work in museums. And I see increasingly the intersection of design uh, and, and arts funding interested in environmental issues. And in this example, um, I think we see the prospect for uh, landscape urbanist strategies, kind of an acupunctural urbanism emerging in which the planning bureaucracy is simply set aside in favor of a kind of anemic uh, cultural program. Uh, another example of this kind of arts and landscape installation practice, this is from uh, Israel. Uh, I found out a couple of years ago that Bat Yam Israel was going to launch the first ever Biennale of Landscape Urbanism. Um, I was very happy to hear that somebody was going to have a Biennale of Landscape Urbanism. I was kind of astonished to find that it was in this kind of third row town south of Tel Aviv, but I very happily went there a year ago, um, met with the mayor of Bat Yam. Um, the mayor, when he was elected, had a very robust cultural program. He asked his cultural advisors, how can we build a, a major, you know, world-class art museum in Bat Yam? And they said, well, we have the funding, we can do this, but you understand, Mr. Mayor, we're going to have like the 38th uh, most important regional art museum in Israel, not a huge country, and it's not really going to help identify us on the world stage. Why don't you look at this landscape urbanist idea? And so then, again, instead of going to their city planning department, which was well-staffed and well-funded and doing other projects, they went to their arts and culture groups, and they leveraged public funds for uh, infrastructure improvements combined with private philanthropy, you know, kind of donor culture that you're probably familiar with, and they invited a series of teams internationally to do landscape interventions in this cultural framework. They identified a series of uh, kind of acupunctural points across the city. And again, I'll show you just one example. Um, this is from 2008, from last summer. Um, it's the work of a, a talented uh, Boston-based landscape architect called Chris Reed. Uh, Chris had the temerity a long, long time ago to actually name his firm Stoss Landscape Urbanism. So I I called him up, anybody that had the courage to actually put landscape urbanism on the title of his firm, I thought I should get to know this guy. Um, not surprisingly, the guys at Bat Yam called him and he did a dune installation project, which will be up again in, in 2010 when, when, it's, when it's reconstructed as a Biennale. Um, Chris found that the beach at Bat Yam was one of its great assets on the Mediterranean and proposed reanimating the dune ecology of this beachscape, but also providing certain very, very modest public affordance, you know, a little bit of shade, a little bit of fresh water, a little bit of um, a place to sit or a place for the kids to play. Um, and this is, again, characteristic of this, this type of landscape urbanist work in which environmental installation is combined with a cultural or a social programming. And if I had more time on this, I could tell you more about the, the sequence and their installation and construction. But over the course of this month-long period, Bat Yam found itself transformed and a good uh, maybe one third or one quarter of these installations found their way into more permanent construction. This was a mechanism to bring the planners along, to bring the planning bureaucracy and the mechanisms of city government along into maybe more progressive territory under the rubric of a temporary installation because as, as maybe we're all familiar these days, you can get away with almost anything under the category of art. Of course, by now, there's this other theme which is quite well established of the uh, abandoned or redundant infrastructural site. Um, there is a litany uh, of, of project types, but I'll just identify one. The old airport site is by now a kind of reliable, definitive canon of work. Uh, if you followed the competition for the new park on the old airport site in Athens, the Hellenikan airport site in Athens a couple of years ago, if you followed the competition in Downsview that I've already referenced, for example, you know that by now the old airport site has become a kind of classic landscape urbanist project. I'll show you the most recent one that I've seen. This is from October of this, uh, this past year. I was invited to be a member of the jury in Quito, Ecuador for their competition for their old airport site. If you know Quito, it's this beautiful city up in the Andes, 10,000 feet in the air. The first day and a half of my four day trip was spent just trying to breathe basically. In the next couple of days, we looked at 300 entries from around the world. This is the third place entry by a, a guy called Michael Flynn out of, uh, out of New York landscape architect, um, and he proposed with his team what's now identifiable as a kind of classical landscape urbanist strategy to, in the first instance, find what can be reused on site. And he proposed the recycling of the asphalt of the runway in a very environmentally progressive strategy as the runway being the most durable and most extant, the, the most largest and most sizable in, uh, kind of construction in, in, in this site and then identified the water regime as the primary mover 
essentially closing up the drainage system that had been constructed to allow water to begin to pool on the site. Now, airfields are generally constructed to allow as much water as possible to move across them and through them as quickly as possible. And this landscape urbanist agenda using ecological strategies was exactly the reverse of that, the idea of being slowing down the water, holding it on site, allowing it to puddle and to grow into more complex emergent conditions. Um, if you look at the kinds of diagrams they're making, they're by now almost cliche, right? And equally, they illustrate a kind of public realm which will only grow into its fullness over the course of the next 50 years and with only certain degrees of certainty with respect to its outcomes. And again, the basic argument being that we're trading a more robust public funding, which we've largely given over in this neoliberal economic condition, in favor of a kind of statistical analysis of, well, where are we gonna put those three frogs and 60 trees, given that that's our, our more modest investment, and how can we predict what kinds of outcomes that might afford? Um, in this context, there is, of course, a social program as this park will form a new central park in the context of Quito's relatively dense uh, urban populations. But equally, I think it suggests a new, a new form of public space and a new form of ecological affordance. An equally evident trend of work that I see out there are projects which more directly take the space that have historically been occupied by planning uh, mechanisms. I'll show you two examples of this, um, which are essentially landscape urbanist projects which take up larger regional hydrological systems. Uh, the first of these is the work of a guy called Alex Wall, an urbanist and architect based in Karlsruhe, Germany, uh, and his partner Henri Bava, who's a landscape architect, a French landscape architect of some, of some visibility and of some quality. They produced a project called Green Metropolis uh, over the course of the last couple of years, which is essentially a, a planning construction. Um, it's in the context of European reunification or unification, as you prefer. Uh, and th they, they were working in this river valley which straddles three countries, right? It's, it's Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany, which has no historic uh, linguistic or religious or ethnic identity to it. It simply has this hydrological integrity. Everything that falls into it by way of water makes its way into the center of this place. Um, th it also found itself having no real obvious political organization or structure. And as the European Union project progressed, increasingly cities and towns within this re region found it desirable to identify itself as a region. Uh, in the context of the work going on at Lille, you can see Lille at the bottom left, or at the Imscher Park in Germany, what they found is they were losing market share for new development, for new economic uh, development, but equally for tourism and recreation and leisure. They were losing market share to more identifiable venues that had the national support of the Dutch or the French or the Germans or the Belgians. And in that context, they were trying to invent their own kind of regional identity. Those of you who have read Keller Easterling on Benton Mackay and the invention of the Appalachian Trail understand this argument, which is increasingly common these days, that in fact, the conception of the region is itself a kind of architectonic act. And in this project, Wall and Bava rehearsed that project almost, almost, almost to a scene um, they do a, 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 essentially a kind of neo mccargian analysis, an inventory of the region, identifying two loops. In pink, you can see this loop of culture and new economy, new information economy and attractors for new development. And then a green loop, which are these kind of sensitive environmental or ecological sites, but equally sites for ecotourism and other forms of new economy. In conceiving of the region, they were beginning with an environmental analysis which looked a lot like McCarg's project, but then going beyond a simple welfare state planning practice, which would depend upon a welfare state that had public funding, they actually proposed fairly neoliberal economic ideas to brand this new region and to launch it into the public imaginary. And this is again another typical uh, condition of landscape urbanist practice that equal attention goes into the ecological environmental analysis as goes into the branding strategy. Ultimately these teams in the case of Downsview being led by a graphic designer here, simply having uh, graphic designers, brand managers and the like advising them. So for Wall and Bava, this practice of landscape urbanism essentially begins with environmental and economic issues, but then becomes a question of public branding, identifying in the public imaginary or in the brand space of, of consumers for certain kinds of lifestyles, venues for opportunity. 
And this helps to construct the region, ironically, then as a political entity. It's a kind of reverse engineering of, of, of the sort that the traditional planning bureaucracy is simply incapable of lacking the political structure. Another example of this tendency for landscape to emerge as a medium to organize itself around systems of water. This is the work of Christopher Height, uh, who teaches at Rice University and his students. Uh, Houston happened to be the site in 2001 of a pretty fierce tropical storm that dumped an enormous volume of water. Of course, in the context of Katrina, it's kind of an historical footnote, but certainly the impact that it had economically on the city and, and spatially and physically on the city uh, w was quite profound. Um, Houston happens to be, and the Rice campus happens to be adjacent to, the largest uh, medical complex in North America called the Texas Medical Center. And after this Allison storm event, their planners started looking at the catastrophic potential of a larger storm. If you had a storm the size of Katrina that were to hit Houston, it would have enormous and disastrous effects for the largest medical complex in North America. All of these basements having generators to support the hospitals above them, imagining a kind of doomsday scenario. So they went not to the city of Houston's planning bureaucracy or city planners, nor did they go to architects or urban designers. They went to a landscape urbanist. Christopher Height, you'll recall, is an academic who wrote one of the first essays in the Mohsen Mostafavi edited uh, landscape urbanism book that came out of the AA. Height had taught at the AA, and Height is now teaching at Rice and led his students in what's essentially using a landscape urbanism project to do a kind of planning. Um, they worked on this one bayou as a test case. This is the kind of typical case of the bayou in which it's basically been devoid, kind of denuded of all, of all vegetal material in a kind of post-World War II hydrological engineering regime. Um, its primary goal here is to look as efficient as possible and to prevent uh, the, the kind of slowing of water flow. Now the critique of the damming and, and, and hydrological engineering of our cities is out there and it's available and I'm interested in that. But for our purposes here, what I find more interesting is that on top of that engineering analysis, on top of the basic planning and environmental analysis, they did, Haidt and his team, a kind of more traditional uh, social and programmatic analysis, identifying a range of sites along the river, the bayou, identifying a range of new affordances, new public programs and new users, and then did a kind of classic uh, kind of series of community meetings. When you look at it, they did essentially what planners are, are meant to do uh, in the context not of an absent uh, planning department, but rather two competing jurisdictions. You have the kind of city of Houston's own hy hy hydrologic, hy hydrologic uh, infrastructure, its own mechanisms for managing stormwater, but equally its own planning bureaucracy. And along this Braze Bayou, which kind of sits adjacent to the Rice Campus and adjacent to the Texas Medical Center, identified three sites for which they did schemes, leveraging, most importantly, private development, using the reanimation of this river course, introducing new wetlands back into what had been a kind of engineered surface, these are places in which for 48 weeks a year, you can have new social programs, you can have recreational programs, you can even have ecological or environmental uh, conditions which are quite uh, interesting and diverse. And then three or four weeks of the year, they will be subject to flooding. They also open up new sites for, for development in the city itself. And th these studies and the studies of many other projects like it have indicated in fact, tax revenue coming off of this new development can in fact produce um, both construction, but equally maybe uh, maintenance funding for ongoing development of landscape spaces. Um, now this is, of course, uh, not exhaustive by any means. One could find many, many projects like this. But what I find interesting in both of those examples is we have landscape urbanists being invited in precisely to replace what's now perceived to be a less than effectual planning mechanism, um, not because planning wasn't, wasn't available, but rather because it seemed inadequate to respond to the environmental and economic conditions. Increasingly, I think one could come to this conclusion that landscape urbanists are filling a strange kind of void. On the one hand, inheriting from McCarg an interest in the organization of natural environments and ecological process, but then leveraging them in this status of high design. I increasingly demanding, in fact, that teams bring with them design capital or cultural capital as a part of their funding mechanism to support the kind of uh, oxygen of, of private philanthropy. And then a, a third condition in which uh, increasingly those design teams are asked to essentially lead what we think of as a public process to build uh, the brand identity, let's say, of a place like Fresh Kills or a, or a place like uh, Wall and Bavaz Green Metropolis. 
Now, as I mentioned, Toronto, my, my adoptive home, has come to be um, one of the more important venues in North America for these kinds of developments. So I thought I would just show you a couple of examples. You probably are familiar with the New York examples. Uh, now, now, that, um, now that Bloomberg has engineered a third term for himself, I think many of those projects will continue in spite of this economic downturn. But in Toronto, we happen to have an interesting run just now of a, a number of landscape architects who are being hired to essentially do what urban designers and planners have done historically. Uh, this is Toronto's Inner Harbor. And uh, a couple of years ago, it was the site of a design competition for a new uh, master plan and urban design project. Um, it was an open call across disciplines internationally. The shortlisted five uh, included four, I think we could call them four celebrity architect-led teams. Um, very, very, you know, well-organized and well-funded. And one team led by a landscape architect, and the landscape architect-led team happened to have won the competition. It, this was the work of Adrian Hoos and West Aid, his firm from Rotterdam. Um, if you've been to Borneo and Spornberg and Amsterdam Harbor, you know that Hoos and his firm have emerged as kind of sober urbanists. And it's quite ironic. I mean, he started his career as a kind of enfant terrible, kind of provocateur, having been a, 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 a kind of um, an employee at OMA, coming out doing very, very provocative landscape strategies. His urban design work has emerged in, in the European context as, a, as among the most sober and well-considered projects that, that I've seen. And in Toronto, he's proposed this, which is essentially con combining classic urban design strategies for streetcar alignments, tree plantings, building setbacks and heights with the environmental ecological conditions of the foot of the water on, on Lake Ontario. Um, he was the only, he was the, his was the only scheme that maintained the streetcar alignment in its present location. We happen to, in Toronto, enjoy um, hydroelectric power, which is essentially carbon neutral, uh, fueling uh, the electricity for a heavy gauge streetcar system that's, 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 that's quite useful. Um, given that we have this transit system that's essentially zero carbon footprint, it was quite ironic that all of the other architect-led teams ripped up that infrastructure and relocated it at billions of dollars of expense, not to mention its carbon implications, but rather it was Hoos was the only led team that in fact understood that it was the transit that was central to this new community and out of that transit leveraged new ecological habitat on the one hand but also new, new urban design conditions on the other. Equally, of course, Hoos and his team brought with them their kind of Dutch irony and some of their Dutch bridges, which are pretty cool. The first of these have already been built and uh, are continuing to roll out in the inner harbor around, uh, around Toronto. Another project on the waterfront in Toronto is called Lake Ontario Park. It's about 1,000 acres. Uh, this was a, a process that was, um, that was awarded to uh, James Corner Field Operations out of New York. And it's a project that's a lot like planning. It's really meant to organize a whole series of existing landscapes, but also some of the most, um, the most vulnerable bird habitat on Lake Ontario, as this is a kind of very uh, valuable stopover point for birds as they migrate uh, north and south. Um, corner and field operations became the obvious choice as a team that internationally has a re reputation now for organizing ecological literacy with respect to new urban development. And their project, while it's uh, completed its master planning phases, has essentially rehearsed the kinds of uh, phasing and the, the kinds of processes that are traditionally associated with urban planning. Again, these projects on Toronto's waterfront are essentially stealing the march on planning. It's not that Toronto doesn't have planners. I, I think Toronto has maybe per capita more planners per person than any city in the planet. It's ironic that in fact it was you know, the place that James Jacob, Jacobs, uh, Jane Jacobs re retreated to le leaving New York. Um, but for whatever reason, Toronto is a kind of epicenter for, for planning bureaucracy. And there's a whole generation of these planners who perceive their value and their role to essentially protect communities from future development. In the context of the city of Toronto, half the population is born outside the country. Ha half of the five million were born in Tehran or in Chicago or in China. And in that context, the rapid flux, the rapid change, the planning mechanisms uh, are quite anxious about. Um, increasingly, what we see is Toronto is hiring landscape architects, leading landscape architects like Hoos and Corner and others to essentially produce design strategies which will then lead to planning. Um, these design projects come as a result of design competitions. Following from them, they ultimately lead in legislation. The city council will ultimately pass planning mechanisms to pass these into law. 
So it's a precise inversion of the relationship between planning and design practice that I understood when I was in school, in which planning was meant to precede using environmental knowledge and public funding, but equally political mandate. In this context, private philanthropy and private real estate development fuel design strategy. Design strategy emerges. It requires environmental conditions, but equally it requires cultural capital. The intersection of private philanthropy, private development, and environmental ecological literacy produce these new projects in which planning is the final stage, the passing of the ordinance with city council being the official act of planning. Um, the last Toronto project that I'll show is the work of uh, Michael Van Valkenburg. It was, a, again, a design competition from two years ago for the mouth of the Don River. You can see here the Don River has been channelized and empties into the Inner Harbor in Toronto as a result of the <coughs> industrial legacy of the 20th century. And the competition brief was not modest, let's say. It called for the naturalization, quote unquote, of the river mouth to restore a functioning river delta, right? Um, and at the same time to produce new communities to house 50,000 new residents as Toronto is booming at 100,000 new residents per year and trying to make this an attractive destination so that these new residents will not skip the inner city in favor of sit sites in the suburbs. Um, these projects are some of the most recently developed and least published, but also some of the most provocative, I think, for this argument about landscape urbanism because they illustrate a condition in which urban form, the form of community, in fact, architectonic specifications about the form of, of, or shape of the city are given by a team led by landscape ecologists. In this case, this is the Don River Estuary, the competition winning scheme by Michael Van Valkenburg and the urban designer Ken Greenberg. Three new communities on Toronto's waterfront are imagined housing about 48,000 new residents with a restored a fun kind of functioning river estuary. Now, of course, this is a hi highly re-engineered and reconstructed river mouth, but one which does deal with ecological function as a part of its fundamental conditions. For those of you that know the work of Van Valkenburg Associates, or if you know, if you know Michael, he is um, a, 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 among, the, I think, North America's uh, leading landscape architects. When he came to Toronto last year, I introduced him as the Dean of American Landscape Architects. I think he's emerging and consolidating his position over the course of the last 10 years as among the most sober and, and thoughtful in terms of the full realm of landscape architecture as a medium of design. Um, you can also tell from his work that he's He's in a kind of, particularly kind of neo Olmstedian moment. He, he tends to favor images like this, which are, especially for, for clients and for mayors and for funding mechanisms, uh, not terribly threatening. Um, but underneath there, there is a kind of progressivism, both on the environmental front, but equally, equally on, the, on, 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 on the kind of cultural front. And he's consulting with Banish and Banish, the Stuttgart-based architects, and, and, and TransSolar giving him their, their environmental pro forma. So he's got a very, very interesting team and Van Valkenburg has been among the North American firms consistently contributing to this landscape urbanist discourse. Um, I, I thought I would just by way of contrast show you another of the finalist entries to that same competition. This is again the work of Chris Reed Stoss out of Boston. Um, it was a project for a couple of other reasons that the jury couldn't unanimously support as the winning scheme. But in one instance, it clearly went further than all the rest. It devoted more surface area to ecological function than to any other entry in this competition process, giving over at least five times the amount of surface area to emergent and submergent marsh. Um, that combined with Chris's enthusiasm for the kind of edgy, provocative urban quality of these places gives us a nice, a nice counterpoint, I think, to the Greenberg and, and Van Valkenburg scheme. If you were to talk to Chris, he would tell you with Nina Marie Lister, his consultant, um, that they began with this idea of uh, a sex park for fish. They identified in the first instance the species that they wanted to uh, produce, uh, beginning with ideas about, well, which species bring with them um, telegenic images, which species have local community support, which species have funding streams, working upwards from those species, identifying where in the river mouth they would uh, like to live and have sex, and then identifying from that habitat various kinds of environments that they might want to enjoy. Um, Reed is trading in the same kinds of things that Adrian Hoos was trading in with his stripes of mussel shells. The fact that the fish and the birds don't care what these things look like. There's a kind of double coding in which they perform ecologically, the fish will spawn, but they also perform a kind of cultural work in which we're, mo we're meant to see the fact that they don't look natural, these places. They look highly engineered, in fact. And this narrative of things, things being put back to nature is not so easily um, kind of papered over. Um, 
it also produces a new kind of urban space. Uh, and frankly, it's a kind of space, I I'm not sure exactly where we are culturally in terms of our ability to live here. Uh, we used to call it a swamp, we now call it a wetland and we feel better about it. But whether or not we're ready to buy condos adjacent to it is kind of an open question for us in Toronto. I'll report back when we know more about this. But in these images, what you can see is an image of the city in which landscape ecology, in this case, the life of fish, actually drive urban form. Um, Rudolfo Machado, the chair of urban planning and design at Harvard, uh, said in an interview two years ago that the, quote, the ultimate urban form of the landscape urbanist project has yet to arrive, close quote. And I, I, I like Rudolfo, he and I are colleagues and friends, and I respect him enormously as an architect and urbanist. But as I see it, these kinds of projects, um, this and, and, and the last one that I'll conclude with represent what I, what I see as the kind of cutting edge of landscape urbanist practice in which increasingly landscape architect led teams are using landscape ecology to divine not only the shape of parks, not only the, the shape of exceptions to the city, but rather the actual ultimate urban form and typology of this, of this new urban condition. Of course here there's an interest in green building, there is a kind of state of the art interest in solar angles, re relationship to, to ambient environmental conditions like wind and shade, there's the idea about growing algae as a kind of form of pr the production of energy. But equally, and maybe more importantly for our purposes, there's this idea of new forms of, of life, new forms of culture, new forms of recreation, new forms of, 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 of sociability, it, which are essentially driven by this idea that urban form and environmental process are ultimately actually compatible. That we can, in fact, arrive at city form in which environmental process, the health of these places, are not incompatible with the sociability and the economic desirability of living in cities. And in this project and in the one that I'll close with, what I want to suggest here is I think we're reaching a very interesting kind of maturing of the landscape urbanist discourse. Um, you might think of it as a kind of middle age, which is not unproblematic. On the one hand, in certain contexts, you know, in which architects and theorists demand uh, the new flavor of the month every 18 months, landscape urbanism is old news. And there are a whole number of reasons why we could say that landscape urbanism is essentially looking back to work from about 10 years ago. And in many cultural contexts, there is great pressure and demand to move forward to other more pressing cultural concerns and that landscape urbanism is now an historical or archeological fact. Um, in other contexts, the contexts of urban planning and design, the contexts of the real politic of city building, I find the landscape urbanist discourse is actually emerging and all of a sudden now planners, uh, urban designers and, and city officials are increasingly both literate about it and interested to understand what, what do these things mean for the, for, for the shape of actual cities. So I thought I, I would conclude with, with another example of a, a relatively mature image of urban form driven by a landscape urbanist agenda. This is again a, the result of a design competition which was invited to replace what seemed to be a kind of vacuity, an absence in the planning mechanism. This is for a city called Shenzhen in China, a portion of that, that, that city called Longgang. This is a team called Ground Lab. Uh, they're led by Eva Castro, who's the unit leader of the AA uh, Architectural Association Unit of Landscape Urbanism in London. So they're quite, again, explicit about their landscape urbanist credentials. And they also uh, won this design competition against an international array of talent. Um, as a member of that jury, I was quite happy to be one of 16 people that voted unanimously to favor the scheme. And they're now in uh, master planning phase and notwithstanding the economic uh, challenges of, of, of this moment, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see it as a, a fairly a progressive example of landscape urbanist uh, practice. Uh, the brief in, in Shenzhen, as, as you may be familiar with from, from other Chinese cities, was to accommodate a rapidly urbanizing population in the context of ongoing environmental challenges. Um, what was remarkable about their entry was that they did two things much better than any other scheme that we saw. The first that they, thing that they did was they identified and did a survey of the existing Pudong fabric. Uh, every other scheme that we saw saved exactly one block of historic fabric and called it a shopping mall, demolishing everything else uh, in its wake. Um, this team, the landscape urbanist team, argued that no, we need to understand the grain of the city as a cultural and historical artifact and that we actually need to process to curate portions of this fabric and maintain portions of it that are of some historic, physical, cultural value. Um, they weren't suggesting that this map, which identified which portions to be kept, was the definitive artifact, but rather they proposed a process whereby they would talk about which pieces to be kept. Um, maybe e equally progressive was their ecological approach to the health of the river. 
uh, whereas historically this portion of Shenzhen had been organized around the river, it had been um, basically turning its back on the river in, in the fashion of, of, of many cities in the world for a very, very long time. And they did, this team, the most progressive environmental analysis and ecological restoration plan of any of the schemes that we saw. Again, a kind of landscape urbanist uh, kind of fundamental. Um, increasingly in projects like this, I think we can see a kind of evident alliance a kind of uh, an ongoing relationship between the advocates of the so-called everyday urbanism. If you followed the work of Margaret Crawford, who's coming back to California, apparently, the Bay Area, shortly. Um, increasingly, we can see that landscape urbanist practices are quite commensurate with ideas about historic preservation or ideas about community-based community, uh, community -based planning or design. Um, but it's actually the environmental issues which are bringing a kind of ascendancy to landscape urbanist practice. Uh, like many typical landscape urbanist projects, their entry, the Castro-led team, produced a very uh, detailed analysis of existing and new plant material, and maybe more significantly, a kind of typologically rich analysis of what kinds of landscape types were available, and then produced very, very detailed, richly understood sectional relationships between new pieces of infrastructure and a, a kind of uh, pu public space that was perceived to be of, of high value. Only after all of that work, only after the historic analysis, the remnant of fabric of the city, after the environmental analysis of the river and its recuperation, only then did they venture into uh, more architectural or typological questions, allowing the street section, for example, to emerge out of a very, very rich environmental analysis. Again, we could say this is characteristic of landscape urbanist practice. And maybe among the most progressive of, of the aspects of their project, and again, kind of pushing out at the edges of landscape urbanist work, what they proposed for the planners of Shenzhen who, who, who had organized this competition process was that rather than giving them a physical model, a physical master plan of the end state, the formal concrete product of what the city would look like as a spatial or formal construct, they proposed a so-called relational model or what you might think of as a, a parametric model You'll recall that parametrics has had a kind of uh, currency within architectural discourse in the last 10 years, the idea of using algorithms and other mechanisms, other digital platforms to array uh, relationships between data, between information, so as to allow them to arrive at form, which has a kind of distancing effect from uh, the connoisseurship or the shape making of architectural culture. Uh, that work, which came largely out of the design research lab, the DRL at the AA in London and other places 15 years ago, has now moved into discussions of urbanism. And if you follow the work of Patrick Schumacher and Zaha Hadid and others, the idea of a parametric urbanism is a part of the discourse in London and New York and other places these days. Um, this team brought the parametric model into a landscape urbanist project. And in this array, this kind of Excel spreadsheet, what you see here um, is not really a physical model of the shape of the city, but rather think of it as an Excel spreadsheet. On the left, you have these series of heights if you were to set limits at two floors, three floors, eight floors, 18 floors or higher, a set of decisions that can be made. On the right-hand side, a question of density. How dense do you want the city to be? Half FAR, one FAR, 10 FAR. On the bottom, you can see a series of uh, typological codes, A1, A2, A3. They respond or refer to various type, types of buildings and block structure which are available in, in the city. Using this mechanism, what they proposed was that rather than giving their patrons, the planners in Shenzhen, who were looking for answers, a physical outcome, they gave them a process. They said, we will invite a public conversation about the ultimate form of the city, and the ultimate form of the city should be the resultant of a set of decisions about height, density, and setback, all of which come after the environmental and cultural analysis. Um, and ultimately, these images, while uh, granted they're, they're, they're inconclusive, suggest to me landscape urbanist practice is increasingly interested in the parametric modeling and the symmetry between parametric modeling or other digital platforms and the indeterminacy coming from the discourse around environmental systems. Um, if you've followed the discourse in architectural theory in the last 10 years, you see increasingly architectural culture is lifting ideas, concepts, terms, models from the study of the natural world. You might think of this as we're all now reading Darcy Thompson again, right? but for different ends, right? What I find so astonishing is that architectural culture is lifting models from the natural world, yet at the same moment, landscape urbanist practices arguing we should be studying the natural world so as to better organize empirically the shape of the city. 
Uh, I held a, a seminar this fall at, at, at the GSD at Harvard on precisely this issue and invited architects, urban designers, and planners, and landscape architects to start reading the same material together because increasingly what I see is a kind of confluence or symmetry between the discourse around indeterminacy coming from high status architectural culture. Think of Eisenman, post-functionalism, distanced authorship as a kind of criticality, right? And the claims coming out of landscape urbanist practice about distanced authorship, indeterminacy, and open-endedness in very complex urban and ecological environments. Um, I, I won't say more about that here in this context, but what I want to suggest to you in closing is that increasingly we can see internationally examples in which landscape urbanism is emerging as a medium through which urban form can be, can be arrived at. And increasingly what we find is that, in fact, uh, these strategies of design use landscape ideas to organize the ultimate shape of the city. Often that shape of the city comes not as the result of planning practice, but rather in lieu of it. Thanks very much. say that, you know, some of the best friends are usually cliches, but I think it's fair to say that in terms of their cultural value, there was this moment in 99 when that was all new, you know, and the idea that you could use street sweeps as a way to kind of organize that, um, you know, San Francisco you can say, yeah, that was the future. In 2001, that was the future. Um, and it speaks to the half-life of these bodies of work. Um, but to your point, I think it's fair to call them cliches. Um, the relationship between those cliches and the history of some point. 
can I say first? Um, there's an inherent tension in the project because on the one hand, as you say, it needs to signify culturally as not being natural by definition. If it's mistaken for natural, then it's just folding the 19th century trope of the park as an exception to nature and it doesn't have the cultural dimension that it needs. It also needs to be legible for funding mechanisms for real estate development for a whole set of other reasons. And there's a tension between that need for it to appear to be artificial or a cultural construct and these processes which they're using to project and show us over time. The most, the most lucid example of this has been this, this, you know, this idea that um, you can plant in certain geometries but then succession will accelerate those geometries and up and toward other ends. And what I find among the most interesting things these days are people who are studying that kind of statistical analysis of like, how are we likely to see this succession process go on? Um, one of the real vulnerabilities has been, we live in a culture of shorter and shorter political duration, right? You know, I, I referenced Bloomberg before the term. Uh, Bloomberg has been an enormous supporter of these land use projects in New York. And the fact that he's got a third term instead of just two is actually freeing. <coughs> and it's meant that some of them will continue. But there is this other problem that you point to where these projects depend upon 50 years of indeterminate growth, but we have political mandates for like six months, basically. Um, Chris Reed developed a diagram in his practice in which basically a project is maintained for many, many years by different <coughs> actors. So instead of thinking about the project being commissioned by one agency, one city, one mechanism, he proposes that the idea of the project is a kind of mental imaginary. And his goal is to keep it a lot, a lot, a lot in air for long enough to realize parts of it by keeping different funding mechanisms, different community groups at their crest. And I think there's a lot of interest in that just now where the kind of multiplicity is, a, is needed to fill in for you know, economic downturns or changing political regimes or, or this kind of thing. But in addition to the representational question, there, there is this fundamental kind of contradiction between we need time, we don't have the political or economic time to go like this. In addition to time, isn't there a kind of economic uh, sensitivity or uh, isn't there a kind of dependency on patronage or a, 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 a instability for, for this kind of work to work properly? Uh, I mean, have you uh, uh, thought about in Shenzhen just because I, you know, every time I give a talk, the first question is, yeah, that's all great. Well, then what about China? <laughs> China's booming, right? So I got, that, I got that caught up, and now the economy all went to hell. So I, got, I, have, I have to have a new talk, basically. Um, I mean, landscape urbanism emerged in part in response to shrinking cities and economic downturns. So I think we're going to have an answer there. Um, but a part of the basic claim is that we've gotten out of the business of politically organizing and publicly funding big projects. And there, there's two parts to that that I've tried to point to. One is the economic side, right, where we've organized ourselves, I think for, for the worse, to not publicly fund education, not publicly fund healthcare, and you know, public space improvement and, and deer habitat are kind of down the list, right? Um, the other side of it has to do with the mechanisms of planning and what we tell ourselves in the design disciplines. And as I was trained, I basically learned that modernism was the problem and that we need planning to basically prevent us from being designed. And I find it increasingly evident that most planning bureaucracies are trying to you know, play defense and are perceived to be ineffectual at affecting any kind of change. And that's also related to this neoliberal economic condition. So the economic downturn obviously has changed, has jambled its map. Um, but in terms of our, our act, the urban design implementation, whether it's typological analysis, what does it mean to do a green building in this kind of context? That stuff is increasingly evident. And my purpose tonight is to show that it's happening and to point to certain examples. In Toronto, I was sitting on the design review panel in Toronto. The development team there is looking at 2013, 2014, 2015 occupancy. This, these are all brownfield sites. There's nothing there right now. So they're kind of proceeding apace. I mean, Canada's been slightly better off in terms of its financial markets than the US has been. But the basic foundation in Toronto seems very sound. And notwithstanding the economic downturn, I think on the other side of the 
business cycle, we will be looking again at questions of public space and, and development. Um, I think that the question might be framed as how do these projects sustain themselves in more modest ways in the enlightenment? How do you get a fresh kill over the next couple of years? And that points to the green strategy of finding some kind of funding, whether it's private philanthropy, money towards that species, or identifying new streams of money in, in infrastructure or, or development. Yeah, it's true. It's, I hadn't, hadn't thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think it's, it's ironically firm ground for me to have the debate on. You know? um, there's a kind of weird division of labor where in flyover country, the, the new urbanists still have the high ground. You know, like if, if you're in a little town in Illinois, the mayor and the rest of the city planning will largely be an unrepentant new urbanist still. Um, but New York and Toronto have emerged, not coincidentally, I think the two biggest cities in the two countries as the, the primary venues for land use urbanism because they're big. They have culture demands and funding. They have economic engines, and they have these brownfield and water relationships. Um, and those brownfield and water relationships, I think, are um, you know somehow good venues. They, they they bring up these kinds of solutions. I think uh, increasingly. So um, we were talking about that in the community this afternoon. Is that you know what's the first question? Where's the water going? Because it's like water bills. You know, like you know, follow the money. It's like follow the water bills. Um, and that's a, you know, it's kind of classic McCartian trope, right? I mean. But it's not just enough to follow the water, you've got to follow, then you have to follow the money. Great. I, um, a couple of points I want to share with you here. Um, Charles actually, um, we spent about two years at Penn, and in two seconds, one is in rather uh, formulated architectural practice, which is not totally bad, but still formulated by many kind of um, tenants and, and paradigm that we're so familiar with. In that environment, Charles, you always hear there's fighting in the office, but there's Charles and the partners. And the fighting is fierce, it's never ending. And that was one uh, environment. The other one is at the school, where you constantly hear also arguments, but in such a positive, engaging mode. So I have known Charles in both of the world in that, in that two years. But then the context of where the idea of urban landscape was found, I, I wanted to also share with maybe younger students here. Back in the time, you see uh, the discipline of um, planning, urban design, architectural landscape was somehow um, uh, a diffuse by two movements. One is actually by a kind of willingness to fade out of the original responsibility. Each of them have to claim, therefore define their core mission. Fading. Urban planning faded out, and landscape by traditional design, uh, design is also kind of faded out, shine out. And architecture was particularly sadly so because they indulge in this um, tableau, this, this description of either the aging of the economy or complete surrender of academic pleasure. And that was the 80, late 80s <laughs> and early 90s. So when the land, the urbanism, that the other motion is actually the kind of intelligent, smart claiming of bigger boundary and bigger territory that actually includes the other disciplines. That, that, that would be this thought. And therefore it was really uh, for 20, 15 years was probably the most intense uh, rigor and parchment that actually we reclaim the responsibility of designers, not, not landscape or urban uh, planning, but designers in design operate, operators and integrated intelligence that reclaim the responsibility of effectiveness in urban development. And that's actually a, really a great uh, courage for what's going on here. As we all know, we are in the process of really kind of um, uh, uh, reinvigorating uh, re uh, re uh, our hopeful and true couple key points. And landscape is really one of them. And uh, the connection with, with Charles has been Simulating is a constant kind of uh, blessing of our kind of uh, uh, apprentices through the years. And we would like to have him uh, come here more.
means that I want to be known and you know, that they will keep following. Thanks. Thank you. Great. This one? I was just with Jim two, two, three days ago. Oh, yeah, how are you? Yeah. Always shiny bread. <laughs> Already, this is the new transition back here.